Hello and welcome to the Props Clear podcast. I'm your host, Jillian Angeline. We're talking all about drones and about improving public perception surrounding the unmanned aircraft. Now, these episodes are for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only, so none of these constitute legal advice. Before we get to today's guest, I want to talk to you about a product I've been using the last couple of months that's made things so much easier, especially in networking. It's the Popple Digital Business Card. I chose the shiny gold one, and what Popple does is create a unique QR code you see right here for yourself. And with just the tap onto someone's phone, they're able to get your contact information and any pertinent links like LinkedIn or to your website or portfolio. It's very helpful. And that special QR code can also go on things like keychains or bracelets. Now, if you use my code, Angeline, A-N-G-E-L-I-N-E, you can get 20% off your order. And I make a commission on some of the products on that website. Now fasten your seatbelts and let's get started. Today's guest is Kat James. She's the founder of 400 Feet, a drone data consultancy group. And she's also the hashtag drones for good girl on LinkedIn. She's coming all the way to us from Nairobi, Kenya. Kat, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited to talk with you. First of all, tell me about your mission at 400 Feet and why this is such a passion project for you. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's such an honor to be on the podcast. Um, yeah, so 400 Feet is a drone and data consultancy based in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, and we focus on working with social good use cases. So like our client, our, our typical clients are you know, researchers, NGOs, and social good organizations. Um, and yeah, it's just such a passion project because I think that there is so much room for innovation in all of these sectors and so much benefit. And I think that we really just scratched the surface on the utilization of drone technology. And so I'm really passionate about working with people in different sectors to see, you know, how they can use the technology to, to elevate their impact. One of your posts that I loved, you know, you do a lot of hashtag drones for good posts, especially on LinkedIn. Um, so if anyone doesn't follow her yet, follow Kat James. She has excellent use cases. You talk about uh, using drones for water uh, inspection and water quality across the world. You give examples of detection of drinking water leaks in Israel, spraying disinfectant in open air markets in Ghana. So that's not a water example, but um, monitoring algae bloom contamination of drinking water in South Korea. And you use the, uh, the acronym WASH. Can you explain that and talk about why you think this is so important? Yeah, definitely. So um, WASH stands for water and sanitation. Um, and it's a kind of big segment of the international development community or like in the global health space. Um, there are like WASH programs. Um, and so these especially come up, um, like some of the use cases that you described, in situations where there might be informal settlements, um, like large slums or refugee populations, um, as they're trying to manage these types of informal communities. Uh, drones have been really helpful in figuring out like, okay, yeah, where, you know, where is the sewage going? Where is the water going? How can we ensure, you know, the health and safety of these communities? So going from 400 feet as the founder um, to like a 10,000 foot view, what brought you to Kenya? And uh, what is your background that makes you so focused on doing all this work to help people, uh, especially in the African continent? Yeah, definitely. So um, my background is actually in global health, uh, which provides this context. And so um, that is in university and undergrad. I was a double major in uh, geography, specializing in geographic information systems and global health. Um, so I've been kind of working this space for a really long time. Um, and, you know, basically with the idea of how do we leverage spatial data to improve health outcomes. Um, and so from there, like I got a dual master's in public health and information science. Um, and so I've kind of really, you know, tried to figure out how I can make an impact in the global health tech sector. 
Um, and so, you know, along the way, I, you know, came to find drones and both with their, you know, mapping capabilities as well as all the use cases that are happening in public health right now. Um, it just really caught my eye and I was very interested in it. And um, why Kenya? I actually, for most of my 20s, was um, a consultant on a variety of different projects on the African continent. So um, I worked for many years in Ghana, Liberia, and Zambia. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to be kind of based on the African continent, but I was uh, moving around a lot and I was ready to have a home base. And Nairobi is, it's um, one of the biggest cities in the African continent and it's a real tech innovation hub. And most of the organizations that do work on the continent um, have a headquarters here. So it's a great place to be located because kind of all the movers and shakers on the continent have a presence here. So it's really fun. That's just incredible. I have never been to the African continent yet. Yeah, it's one of the few continents I'd like to cross off my list and see for myself. So I think it's great that you're not only there uh, as a, you know, as a way to help people, but also you're living there. So you see day in and day out, you know, the good, the bad, what needs to be improved, correct? A hundred percent. Yes. The good, bad, <laughs> and the ugly. And yeah, and Kenya is a, a really wonderful place to live. It has a little bit of everything. Um, it's a fun place in the kind of drones context because there's a lot of cool innovation happening in the sector. What, uh, you know, Africa has done so much work in the drone space. I feel like in some ways they're a lot farther ahead than the U.S. Um, in a lot of their work. When we were talking on a webinar recently, um, I was on that webinar with you talking about what you saw with what Zipline's done. You know, eight takeoffs of medical supplies on a random Sunday. I don't think I can say that anywhere in the continental U.S. Uh, why do you think Africa is, is doing so much and is on such a forefront in this industry? Yeah, I think it kind of started out because in especially for drone delivery, it's just, last mile um, healthcare delivery is just such a compelling use case. Like you can have such a meaningful impact and these drones are actually saving people's lives. And um, in a way that, you know, it, it will be cool to see um, medical drone delivery expand to more urban um, or U.S. European context. But often, you know, you might be saving minutes as opposed to hours um, when you're talking about distribution. So I think that it was a really kind of compelling place to start, as well as with that, there was funding there because there's the international development like donor community. Um, we're very invested in, you know, catalyzing innovation in the sector. And so a lot of the seed funding um, for these organizations ha came through those channels. Um, as well as I think it's just a lot easier to do in practice because there's a lot less crowded airspaces. And so the things, you know, the challenge of building some of these networks is a lot easier um, when, you know, you're not having to deal with so much manned um, aviation. Uh, at the same time, though, I would say that we've kind of maybe kind of halted a little bit. Um, I don't think that I think that there was exponential progress um, earlier mm -hmm. on, and now there's kind of been a reckoning on the continent. And I think a lot of governments are now in the process of, because before it was kind of the Wild West, there wasn't any regulation. Mm -hmm. So people were just kind of playing around and doing it. And now that there has been so much progress, a lot of governments are now saying like, okay, let's hold on, let's stop. Let's like um, try to define our own regulations. Um, but something that has been challenging is you can't necessarily copy paste regulations from, you know, the US or Europe in this context, just because, yeah, it's a different context, a different use case. Um, so there's been a lot of work uh, where, you know, now I feel like a lot of the regulations on the African continent, of course, it's different by country, uh, but there's some of the most restrictive in the world. And so now it's like it went from being the Wild West to being super restrictive. And now we're kind of like fighting for that middle ground. And, you know, I think that progress will be made, but um, we're kind of in that period of time. Oh, what are some of your current projects right now? 
Um, yeah, so right now, speaking of regulations, I'm doing some consulting work. Um, I don't think I'm allowed to say the country, but uh, I'm helping analyze drone regulations and provide feedback from an operator's perspective. Um, so like that was something I've been working on this week. So basically going line by line through everything and and explaining, okay, what, because there's a lot of things in, you know, drone regulations that might sound good in practice. Um, and you're like, yeah, like I want to respect people's privacy or um, I think it is good to ask for this type of authorization. Uh, but in practice, it's overly burdensome for the operators um, and so it isn't necessarily feasible. So like um, a challenge, not the one that I was working on, but like in Kenya, um, in order to fly, you need to get a letter of no objection from the people who own the land that are associated where you're flying, no matter um, the type of project. And so it can be really challenging um, if you're trying to do a project in another part of the country because you basically have to go to that part of the country, get a signed approval from like the chief of the village, fly back to the back to Nairobi, submit your application. And so there's stuff like that where it's like, yes, we we want to establish, you know, good drone laws, but there are things that are really challenging to implement in practice. That's almost worse than here in the US. You were right. Oh, I, I think it is worse. Like other things um, in Kenya, we have to pay every single time we fly, even recreationally, um, which is really hard. Not insurance. This is just paying. But, yeah. So, well, we have to get authorization for every flight. So even if you're flying as a hobbyist, um, you have to have authorization. You have to go through a, um, in order to get your Kenyan drone license, you have to go through an approved training program and they cost like 1500 USD. Uh, yeah, so it's, wow. and then I have to pay every single time I fly my drone. Uh, so it's stuff like that, that um, it's incredibly cost prohibitive for a lot of people. And um, so part of what we're working on is, you know, with the regulations, it's like, okay, how do we, like, that? that's a huge cost at this time. Um, it's a huge barrier to adoption here because, yeah, if it costs, like, basically with all the fees and stuff, like $2,000 to get your drone license and you have to pay every single time you fly, um, it's just inhibiting innovation in the sector and it makes it harder for people to start drone businesses. If someone wants to be a consultant in this space, do you have any recommendations for what they can do uh, beyond just getting the Part 107 here in the U.S.? Yeah, I think that having a specialization in a particular area um, is really good. So it's kind of pairing your drone knowledge with another skill set. So for instance, another thing that you know has been kind of surprising to me, but has evolved, uh, something that I get asked to consult a lot about is um, working with drone companies or with drone initiatives and helping them with their like communication plans, for instance. And so I did not go into this being like, oh, I'm going to be a drone like communications specialist. Um, yeah. But that's something that there's a lot of consulting work out there for because there's a lot of people who have the technical knowledge in the space, but they don't necessarily how to know how to like, you know, tell compelling stories or do the marketing or reach their target audience. Um, and so if you can pair that skills, the, the drone knowledge and skill set with another thing um, or doing things like, you know, if you're really good at, you know, working with, um, data and creating like data plans or monitoring and evaluation plans, or, you know, maybe you're somebody who's, uh, an expert in, you know, operations and you can help, uh, drone companies improve their business workflows and stuff like that. So I think there's a lot of places to add value in the space and it's kind of figuring out, okay, what is your kind of secondary skill set that you can, apply to this context. So you have a health background, health, sanitation, public health. Uh, what made you jump into the drone space? It, I wish I had a better start. I think it kind of started <laughs> with um, 
I don't know. As the like, as I, the official drones for good girl, which I'm gonna start no, with. I'm probably like probably like ten years ago or I don't know eight years ago. Um, I saw somebody flying a drone. And I was like, that looks really fun. And I was like, I want to be the kind of person who flies a drone. Like that's really kick ass. Um, so I just like bought one. And as soon as I had it, I was like, okay, I was obsessed. I loved it. It was like you know, drones are just really fun to fly. And as a hobbyist, like I love, you know, that's what I like to do in my free time. Um, but then it was kind of, it was timed nicely with, um, you know, getting a drone, enjoying it as a hobbyist. And then I was actually working in Ghana on a project unrelated to drones. Um, but I was at a health facility in Eastern Ghana and, uh, a woman was starting to kind of hemorrhage after, uh, delivery. And luckily the, the health facility that I was working at, they were on Zipline's um, drone delivery network. And so the midwife just sent a WhatsApp message to the Zipline facility, like a drone came and dropped a package of blood outside the health facility like 20 minutes later. And it was no big deal. And honestly, it was the most shocking thing that I've ever seen. Um, I think that, <laughs> we're, no, working in, this, in the global health or like international development sector, there's just so many like pilot projects. <laughs> no, it's it's so cool. There's there's so many like pilot projects and innovation type things that, you know, they somebody throws some funding at them, but they don't like actually materialize into anything. And so I had all like, you know, I had heard about drones being used in the sector and I kind of wrote it off of like, you know, eye roll. That's just another one of those gimmicky things that they're gonna try and it isn't gonna go anywhere. And I had no idea that what, like the scale that was currently being implemented at and just like how effective and, and how operational it was. Um, and so to see that in practice and, and with my experience, you know, working in last mile health communities, it just felt like a no brainer where it's like, yes, like this is how we're going to, you know, solve last mile healthcare delivery. Like this makes so much sense and just being able to see it in practice. Zipline seems to be the, the name brand everywhere that, you know, people know who they are. Why are there not other companies out there, uh, you know, trying to buy for that space? Or are there? Yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say there are. There's probably like, I don't know, 20 to 40. The top runner, so Zipline definitely has the largest market share and they, you know, were kind of the early adopters, the first ones in the industry, but other big players um, Swoop Arrow from Australia, Wing Copter from Germany, uh, Riggy Tech from Switzerland, um, AV from the Netherlands. Um, oh my God. There, yeah, there's probably like 20 or 30 um, pre established companies. I think now the big challenge though is. They've, I feel like the technology is largely there at this point. And mm -hmm. we've been able to establish that, you know, medical drone delivery does actually work. It is feasible. Um, and it actually is having the desired outcome of like, um, you know, increasing things like vaccine coverage and um, organizations like Zipline and like Village Reach uh, in, paired with Supero. They've done a lot of work to set the stage and collect all of this evidence to, to demonstrate that this, you know, is worth doing and is a you know actually having its intended consequences, um, but now the big challenge is cost effectiveness and making it a sustainable business. Because part of the challenge, um, you know, they entered all these drone companies entered the health market mm. because it is a, a great use case, but it's something where they they've been having a hard time getting utilization rates high enough that it's cost effective. So, um, you know, one of the, the challenges is that drones are something that they benefit from economies of scale. So the more you um, fly drones, the more cost effective they are. And, you know, in the health sector, there's kind of a limited demand. Like a hospital only needs so many deliveries. It's not like, you know, e-commerce or Uber Eats or something where like, you know, there's always more customers that need deliveries. Um, so there's been kind oh, of- that's interesting. A shift where now, yeah, so now a lot of the companies, they're trying to figure out like, okay, how do we expand into other markets to like offset some of our costs? Like, I, I think it's become clear that even though it's effective and the technology works, it's not like a viable business case for a drone company to just service the healthcare sector. 
um, they have to figure out how to service other sectors as well. And, and it makes sense because at the end of the day, a drone is just another form of transportation. Um, so what I will, what I would imagine we'll see of more in the future is companies um, like UPS or Freight and Time that, um, you know, Distru uh, the LP3 logistics companies, them having a fleet of drones, and there will be like a subset of their deliveries where it makes sense to use drone versus a truck. Mm -hmm. Well, I had just spoken with uh, Evan Hertzfeld with A to Z drone delivery, and we were talking about you know this winch that they created so that you know items could be delivered at altitude to keep it safe in certain areas, especially in more densely populated areas. Uh, so that could include anything from pizza boxes to life-saving medical equipment like EpiPens. Yeah, 100%. And I think that there, there is also that shift of like, you know, the, the original projects, you know, they're delivering things to rural communities where there's like large areas to land and stuff like that. But when you're trying to shift to more urban environments, like of course, or urban residential, like, yeah, you need that winch system. Um, and so there's, yeah, that's been a big shift in the market as well as introducing that type of technology. You know, the one thing that I hear from a lot of the drone leaders that I talk to, both in this show and outside of this show, is that battery technology needs to get to where the technology is of the actual drone itself. Um, is that something you're also hearing on the African continent? Um, yeah, and I think that yeah, similar challenges exist. Um, I think that that does also impact when you're like designing drone delivery networks. Um, you know, you'll probably always want to have some sort of like hub and spoke model uh, similar to like airports, um, but it like really impacts how you, the battery life really impacts how you design your delivery systems. Cause yeah, you have to make it so that, you know, you're within one, um, you know, battery of a charging station. And that can actually be really challenging in communities where there's unreliable electricity or there's a lack of electricity. Um, so that's going to be, you know, a huge, if they can improve that, a huge boon to, to the sector. Tell me about uh, what you think is the future of the drone industry in your mind. Uh, I guess, what do you see it as, uh, uh, especially in, in Africa, where do you see that? Yeah, I would love to see them iron out uh, regulations. I think that that's mm -hmm. the biggest barrier at the moment. It sounds that way. Um, yeah, yeah, it's definitely hindering innovation. But then I'd also like to get to a point um, where there's just more widespread adoption and acceptance of the technology because I think that mm -hmm. there are like so many amazing use cases um, uh, and we've you know, been able to kind of demonstrate, and I shared them on my LinkedIn, of like what is possible with drone technology, but only a fraction of the organizations that could be using drones are. And so I think that it's a combination of making it easier in practice to use drones, but then also getting the kind of customers, end users to really understand and see the value um, and get to a point where they're like, oh yeah, like we could totally just order drone data or hire somebody to collect that. Because I think right now there's this perception that, you know, it's overly difficult, overly expensive. Um, I think that a lot of organizations feel like they need to like build out their own, you know, in-house drone team uh, to be able to utilize uh, drones in their, in their mm -hmm. operations. And then they'll go and they'll look at the price of hardware and they're like, oh my God, like that's, totally inaccessible. Um, so I think that, but I, I think that there isn't necessarily this awareness that no, not everybody, not every organization needs to build an in-house, you know, drone team. They, you need to have, um, mm -hmm. you know, specialized drone uh, consultants, drone operators uh, that can service different types of clients. And that sounds really obvious, but I think that like that level of education is not quite there yet. I can see that. What about you? What do you see for yourself? in the next five to 10 years? I know that's a loaded question for anyone, um, but where do you see yourself and, and what, what would you like to achieve? Yeah, I so I'm definitely putting down roots. I would like to 
stay in Kenya for the next five to 10 years and really have an impact on the sector in the East African market. Um, and so I think kind of what I mentioned there, like having, I'd love to have um, more of an impact on kind of regulations, on increasing uh, utilization of the technology, of doing a lot of more activities related to industry shaping, um, creating opportunities for collaboration. Because um, I think that, yeah, I'd love to see more people use drone technology in their work. And I think that there needs, you know, there needs to people be people advocating for its use. And I think that, you know, that takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And um, I'm, I'd love to dedicate my time to that. Africa is the youngest continent of our entire world. How important is it to get kids excited about drones? Not just about, you know, flying them, but about maybe putting them together. Maybe, you know, the engineering behind them, the software behind, uh, you know, the controllers and, and the programs. Yeah, I think it's great. Um, and I think it's really important. And I think it's this whole new career path for people um, that didn't previously exist. And it's been uh, really cool. My friend Eno, um, who, who I know you mean, uh, head of Global Drone Air Academy, he does a lot of work in that sector. And I've been able to be a part of some of his initiatives related to that. Um, but it was very cool earlier this year, um, there was the Kenyan drone business competition. Um, and there it was for Kenyan youth. And it was this basically a pitch competition um, based in the agricultural sector. So um, like youth applied from across the country um, with their business plans, with their business ideas. Um, and so I got to serve as a judge um, and here, I think the top 20. Um, and the winners like won uh, Skydio drones. They won uh, RPL, our uh, remote pilot license, like the, the training, because I mentioned that was really expensive. Um, and so I think that more and more um, opportunities like that for people to get involved, like I think that there is a huge appetite for it and, and people see the value. Well, thanks so much for watching and thank you so much to Kat James for her insight all about the industry, especially on the African continent. If you have topics or suggestions about future episodes, contact me, angelswings.jillian at gmail.com. That's A-N-G-E-L-S-W-I-N-G-S dot J-I-L-L-I-A-N at gmail.com and be sure to follow, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. See you later.